haircut and everything. God. Yeah, I, I, I definitely believe that, uh, yeah, the, the number of footprints on your shirt increases as, uh, <laughs> you know. All right, we are now live on YouTube. Good afternoon, everybody. This is the Vermont State Senate Committee on Institutions. Today is May 6th, 2021. We are having an ongoing conversation about the return of the legislature to the State House. And we have invited various stakeholders in to talk about um, their thoughts. I will first introduce myself. I'm Joe Benning, the chair of the committee. We also have Senator Ingalls from Essex Orleans, Senator McCormick from Windsor, Senator Parent from Franklin County, and late as usual, Senator Ma. Yeah, oh, don't, don't, don't even go there. <laughs> um, this committee, in case you don't know, uh, loves to have some jokes and banter with the witnesses as we go. We try to keep it an enjoyable time. This is a very serious subject, and on the introductory process, I would like you all to know we have people on YouTube that are watching, and we don't know whether it's nobody, a dozen, or a hundred or more. So we try to keep our conversation at the 50,000 foot level to make sure everybody is on the same page. If uh, during your testimony I interrupt you, it may be because you've used some an acronym or uh, some kind of vernacular that we may be familiar with, but the public at large may not be familiar with. It is always friendly for us to reach out and, and make sure that our public audience watching gets to be on the same page that we are. Um, I've invited the press today because I see you as stakeholders in the, the building itself. And as you all know, that is a very historic building. We all miss it terribly. And we are not trying to do anything uh, that is not transparent. And inviting you here today, you are one of a series of stakeholders that um, we would enjoy hearing your thoughts. We cannot make any promises. This is the tip of the tip of an iceberg discussion, uh, but those discussions will become a lot heavier as the few weeks and months approach the uh, next session. And so we are inviting you to just vent in any way or share your thoughts so that we can incorporate them. I am trying to take extensive notes because this conversation is going to be incorporated into several other committee discussions. And I would like to be able at some point in time to be able to relate the things that you're relating to us here today. You also may be invited back again to, to continue the conversation. <clears throat> Having all of that said, um, you are listed on my list by order of how Denise got uh, to hear from you all. And the first person on my list is Mike Donahue. Mike, I see you're coming in here as both with the Associated Press and with the uh, New England First Amendment Coalition. Um, I'm going to start by telling you when we introduce ourselves, we try to give a, a very short background of who we are and how we got to the position we're in so that anybody watching on YouTube may understand exactly who you are and how you fit into the conversation. So welcome to Senate Institutions and we'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, members of the uh, Senate Institutions Committee. Yes, my name is Mike Donahue. I serve as the part-time executive director of the Vermont Press Association, which basically represents the interests of the 10 daily and more than three dozen non-daily newspapers uh, serving Vermont. Um, as some of you know, before my alleged retirement. I spent more than 45 years as a staff writer at the Bronson Free Press, including time covering things over at the State House. Um, I also serve as Vice President of the New England First Amendment Coalition, which is a six state effort to uh, support, defend, and help educate about the First Amendment uh, and NEFAC has indicated that it wishes to share in the comments being made today by the Vermont Press Association. So I'll wrap them all into one, Mr. Chairman, rather than speaking two different speeches. Uh, on behalf of the VPA and NEFAC, uh, we like to take issue with the 
what we feel is the lack of in-depth study and outreach made by Freeman French and Freeman for its legislative space assessment. Uh, we also are deeply concerned that Vermont's longtime moniker or nickname for the State House, the People's House, will soon be lost if either proposed plan is adopted to block the general public from live in-person access inside the building during legislative sessions. The proposal appears to ban the public, the press, and will eliminate, among other things, school trips, bus tours by senior citizens or tourists. It will mean the elimination of the one day, what I call advocacy booths um, by the cafeteria for groups trying to spread the word about important social issues like sexual assault, drunk driving, mental health, domestic abuse, fresh waterways, and so many other important topics that facing this state. Conceivably, it's going to eliminate the concerts that often grace the halls at night and uh, the farmers programs and so many other things. So since the beginning of this country and the creation of Vermont, newspapers have played a vital role in covering the process of lawmaking. We were later joined by radio and eventually television, all with the same mission of providing the public the information it needs to make appropriate decisions about our democracy. During my time as a journalist covering stories here and as somebody who gets invited over to offer testimony and sometimes just coming to visit the State House. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, uh, the, the one thing that sticks out is sort of the awe, if you will, when coming into the, the historic state house. This is really a special place. As legislators sometimes have told me, they may be able to run, but they can't hide. The public can see their hometown legislator in action in the committee room, on the floor, or just having lunch in the cafeteria. Legislators wanna hear what people are thinking. And it's equally important for the press to be able to freely cover Vermont laws and budgets being adopted so that the full impact on taxpayers can be explained. The Vermont Press Association, New England First Amendment Coalition, both urged this committee, the full Senate and the full House to ensure access to the press if and when a decision is made about returning fully to the State House. The VPA and NEFAC are concerned that media members be allowed into the committee rooms to cover in-person testimony. The committee rooms apparently as designed by the architect appear to lack adequate space for the press, the lobbyists and the general public. We realize that long-term steps may be needed to fit everybody in, but the press has a critical role in covering the state house that should be recognized. Government transparency is critical. The Vermont Press Association and NEFAC both are willing to work with you, the architects, or any committee designed to work on the public reopening. We would offer a couple of suggestions. One, that if in-person presence is achieved, that remote access be continued. Not everybody can drop what they're doing and take one or two hours to drive to Montpelier to listen to perhaps 30 or 45 minutes of testimony. Improvements, number two, improvements must be made for remote access. Over the past two sessions, we and presumably you have heard of access issues. When access was unavailable, decisions were made to go ahead with hearings with a statement, oh, they can listen online later. Well, as it turned out, some of those recordings did not fully capture what happened at the hearing. The public was denied the complete legislative record. 
three, when hearings are provided remotely, the broadcast needs to begin early and run late. It is well known that comments are often made in the 20 or 30 minutes before a hearing that may be relevant to the topic. Yet the public sitting at a distance is denied access to what they should have heard had they been sitting in the committee room. Remote access for the public is not an adequate substitute for in-person attendance. While such access sh should be provided for those who cannot attend in person, there still needs to be an opportunity for the public to get face time with their elected leaders and engage with their government in person. Fourth, this is also a matter of accountability. Only with in-person hearings can the public's voice be fully heard. Despite the benefits of technology, remote access software allows public officials to more easily limit citizen speech and avoid contentious issues. <clears throat> and, and lastly, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> as a somewhat last resort, a pool reporter would be acceptable if safe spacing cannot otherwise be secured. But again, that would be a last resort. But the press must be present. Mr. Chairman, we thank you for your time. The VPA and NEFAC is glad to answer any questions now or later after others have spoken. We also stand ready to assist with any further study. Thank you. Mike, thanks for coming. Um, I do want this to be a free flowing discussion between uh, you folks and the committee members. Let me tell you a couple things uh, right off the bat that I think everybody agrees with. Zoom or virtual technology will always be with us in the future. Um, it has become apparent that it provides a vehicle of access to people that have never had it before. And it offers um, some folks the ability to watch us whenever they want. I'm interested in your, your thought process about it running early and running late, meaning before the substantive conversations and after uh, the substantive conversation. And I'll use today as an example. Prior to going on to YouTube, you were with us in the committee room having some general banter back and forth about who we were and, and jokes of each other and that sort of thing. Um, when we first started out this Zoom world, none of us were familiar with how the process worked, but we were all cognizant that substantive conversations had to be conducted in the public eye. Um, I'm curious as to whether or not our conversation before YouTube came on this afternoon is something that you feel from the press perspective should be part of the open process for the public. I think our sense is that there's nothing wrong with that being open to the public. Uh, you know, yes, we will tell the audience uh, that uh, there was some uh, good barbs traded between myself and Senator Maza and uh, and some others and, and, and other members of, of, uh, that are planning to speak today. And um, it's just sort of a banter back and forth. Um, but sometimes it's during that, if you call it pre-hearing pre time, you know, somebody may make a comment that, you know, oh, the corrections commissioner won't be with us this afternoon. He can't come. And maybe people are sitting there waiting for the corrections commissioner to come in and testify. And if they know at 15 minutes before the hearing that they don't have to sit there for an hour and a half waiting for the corrections commissioner, then I don't think uh, it, it hurts. And it, it, again, it may have just been a little side comment made by the, the, um, your, your staff saying, uh, you know, the, the commissioner can't be here after all today. And uh, we see no, no reason why that, you know, shouldn't be out there or couldn't be out there. Um, it certainly would have been heard if they were sitting in that room. So I, I guess that's our initial thought. Yeah, and just, just so you know, early on when we started the Zoom process, I think it was Paul actually that brought to the attention that there were conversations taking place. 
Uh, but we pretty quickly picked up on the fact that we should not be talking about any substantive uh, legislative conversations in the pre-YouTube um, environment. By that, I mean when the flip, the switch got flipped into YouTube, we shouldn't be having those conversations. So even now, we constantly remind each other that we should not be talking about whatever the subject for conversation is um, just so you're aware of that. But one of the most enjoyable things, I said this earlier before you two came on, for us in the legislature is this ability to look into each other's, literally their homes and their lives and get to know each other on a more personal basis. Um, I don't have the foggiest idea why Stuart is sitting in the passenger seat of his car right now, but it's one of those things that you get to look around and, and ask yourself questions and then get to know people in a uh, more personal way. So I concede that that kind of transparency is a very good thing with this system. I think he's still homeless, uh, Mr. Oh, yeah, that that's, right. that's what I was gonna say. We're gonna raise some money for him today. <laughs> I have to do an interview in 10 minutes, that's why. Okay, uh, Senator McCormick, you're on. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, there are, I mean, when you've got people whose job it is to work together on policy, uh, from time to time, someone will slip up and start to talk policy when the public does not have access. Always when that happens, someone says, uh, uh, you're getting into policy and we back off. So I don't, I don't think there's a lot of policy discussion happening out of the public's hearing. And, and, and again, with, with Zoom and everything, that may be true. I, I'm basing it on sitting in committee rooms before Zoom all those years and hearing things yeah. back and forth. And, and with all the committees, you, somebody just texted me, you know, some are just not bantering and, and there may be things that, but who knows? It, it's, we're not seeing or hearing, it's not being recorded. So it's, it's, hard to disprove or prove something when and, you're not in there. And this committee, the talk is generally about the civil war and old cars and <laughs> other guys' facial hair. <laughs> How the world we know it is dying because <clears throat> we're all getting old. Um, I, I wanna, before I turn to anybody else on the committee, hopefully you're still seeing me because I'm getting a message. It says my connection is unstable. Um, but Stuart, you mentioned that you had another interview. Are you literally bound for time here? A little bit uh, from two until 2.20. Uh, I could come back at 2.20. Okay. Um, I have you two down on the list and I don't know if uh, committee members have any questions and if any of the other witnesses here have other obligations, but I'd like to get Stuart in while he's still here in case we, for some reason or other, are not still here at 2.20. Anybody else on the committee have any questions? Mike? We'll wait till, we'll wait till Stuart does. Okay. Mike, appreciate your coming. You're certainly welcome to hang around and listen on. Stuart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome. Thank and you. I believe at one point in time when you were running one of your, uh, your VPR segments, and I was there as minority leader, I distinctly recall suggesting to you that perhaps a politician should run this meeting and have three of you politicians in for questioning at some point in time. I don't know if you remember that, but welcome to Senate Institutions. Well, thank you. Uh, for the record, I'm Stuart Lodetter. I'm from NBC5. I also do uh, some work for Vermont PBS, as you may know, and I've been in the Vermont news business for almost 40 years. Um, I've spent at least, I was trying to figure it out, 25 or six, I think, winters at the State House covering you guys, and for the record, I miss you all desperately. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the report from Freeman French Freeman. I am no architect, don't claim to be, but uh, you know, it seems to make a lot of pretty exciting suggestions to improve the functionality uh, of the building, uh, given the constraints that, that uh, you know, its historic nature uh, would pose to, to any architect and to any sort of renovation project. But I'm going to echo some of what Mike, Mike had to say and what my colleagues, I'm sure, will say, um, which is that I was alarmed by the recommendation that in 2022, the State House would be closed to all but members and staff and uh, that news media would not be permitted inside. 
Um, I think that the message here is, is clear that there is no substitute for in-person coverage of the state legislature. Um, I think that obviously all of this was precipitated by, well, I mean, the state house has been crowded and committee rooms in the house have been crowded for a long time. But I think it was, this was precipitated by obviously the health crisis and the electronic feeds, you know, I think um, work well for some people and for some purposes, and they do provide access uh, to some who could not uh, get to the state house but uh, they don't work very well for reporters who are uh, on deadline doing daily uh, news reporting. And, and if I could, local television in particular um, is especially impacted by uh, the, the technical limitation of the technology. I mean, the fact is that most people don't look very good on Zoom, uh, the Brady Bunch shot, is very limited, uh, and uh, it's it's one reason why, frankly, we have scaled back on our usual coverage. Uh, what might work okay for radio, the audio quality, I think, has been pretty good. Is not good on television. Television needs twenty or fifteen or twenty or twenty-five different shots, different angles, professionally framed, um, color balanced, and you get one on Zoom. I um, mean, that's just the way it is, and. Uh, you know, we've had to accept that, but much more important than the visual is the fact that uh, Vermont reporters uh, lose the ability to interact um, with decision makers on the go, whether that's uh, to ask a follow-up question, to observe uh, maybe an unspoken dynamic uh, in a room, to chase someone down the hall who might not wanna uh, answer a question, and you get no sense of the rhythm of the state house uh, when you're staring at a computer screen from, you know, 50 miles away. Um, so Zoom has been better than nothing, but and for my job, uh, much is lost. Uh, the 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 Freeman French Freeman's ideas for for longer term renovation look, you know, pretty exciting. Uh, it would certainly improve the comfort and functionality of of what are sometimes absurdly uh, crowded. Uh, committee rooms where you are literally, as you all know, uh, in there like sardines. Um, no argument there, but I'm not sure why we would need to prohibit in January of 2022, eight months from now, uh, any access by the news media for a third straight year over concerns uh, around health and safety. Uh, let me point out the obvious, which is that we have a tiny state house press corps. Maybe the smallest uh, in the nation. And barring us, I think will make little or no difference in terms of the demo what happened on opening day this year when we had a pandemic before anybody had a vaccine. And, you know, there was no problem to my knowledge. I mean, congestion at the state house is driven by numbers. And the big numbers are among lobbyists and members of the public and school groups and tourists and spectators and visitors. Um, not the 15 or, you know, maybe 20 of us in the working Vermont media, which is which is all we are, and who I dare say play a pretty key role in disseminating information uh, freely to the people of Vermont about the workings of their legislature. So I would strongly encourage you not to go along with Freeman French, French Freeman's suggestion that the, the media be barred from uh, the state house starting in, in January. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm no architect, but I would just in, in half a minute say that the house committee expansion looks, looks great. Uh, adding larger rooms uh, look great. I mean, obviously they're in very short supply now at the state house. That's why you have two, three press conferences at the Cedar Creek room, which are not very good on television because of that historic and, and, and reflective wallpaper that's right at high fits. I think if you're going to improve technology, we could improve the wiring or the, the fiber optic to the House and Senate chambers such that, you know, the 1980 era cable outlets that, that WCAX installed and only WCAX uh, could be updated now for 2022. Um, and uh, that would provide 
you know, the broadcast outlets with the connectivity to a high speed connection that would not be hard to do. And, and any of the television station engineering folks and IT folks could certainly help um, with that. But um, barring some unexpected downturn or health crisis, uh, the, the real point that I wanted to, to make was that our uh, very modestly uh, staffed Vermont Press Corps deserves access to the People's House in January. And I thank you very much for the opportunity to, to weigh sure. in. Sure. Um, I don't know if you heard earlier, but um, we were really looking forward to this reverse press conference, if you will. And um, I, I want to just pause to note that some of us actually look better. For instance, I took all the time in the world to comb my hair. Corey <laughs> has his own manicurist before he comes on, so he's all prepped and ready to go. And Senator Mazza, well, we just we won't even go there. Um, committee questions for Stuart, Senator Mazza. Yeah, how would, uh, for example, if the, if the epidemic is still on or uh, in January, how would we distinguish who's allowed in the state house and who isn't? How would we separate that group, uh, like uh, lobbyists or press or public? I mean, how how if we had to limit if that was still in, in effect, uh, what what should we do if if that was there? You know, I don't. I I, I recognize that that's a, a delicate uh, issue, uh, and my colleagues, I'm sure, will jump at the chance. Um, it's it's not ideal. I mean, I I agree with Mike. I I'd like to have everybody there, but if we're in that circumstance, uh, you know, um, what what is the definition of a working news media? Is it is it just a, 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 a distributed, whether online or through broadcast or print, to you know X number of people? Um, you know, that that's there are uh, industry folks who could give you a definition. That might be helpful, uh, and I don't want to be a partisan or yeah, I, uh, restrictive in that. I, I um, didn't know if we'd get in trouble by selecting who could come and who couldn't come. That's that's the only question. Well, I mean, it has to be an, an objective standard, okay. um, not someone you like and someone you don't. Right. Um, right. But if you're trying, if you if you feel you must restrict access to, you know, as I said, I, correct me if I'm wrong. I've been going down there a lot, and. Uh, you know, I don't think it's more than 15 or 20 people. And that's a pretty good sized building. You could maintain social distancing without a problem. Um, I, I don't mean to pin this on you particularly, Stuart, but in relation to Dick's question, a vaccine passport, is that something that's tolerated or is that out of the question? Would be for me. I, I think, I, I, you know, again, I, I would think that barring a, a health reason that there you will have broad uptake by then and you know it, it's 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 going to be part of the landscape um in our world going forward uh, maybe not by january but um, and by, by the way i'm not suggesting that that's something that has to be done i'm only asking the question to get your reaction to it senator parent my question, you know, I'm not opposed to having the press back in, but my thought is, is usually the press isn't well dispersed around the state house. There's one or two committees or one or two conversations that has everyone's attention. Do you have any thoughts on how we manage a situation like that? You know, we're not talking about putting one person from the press in each committee room. You know, I think of it as, you know, budget's time. You might have six or seven folks trying to be in the same committee room. How do we, what are your thoughts on managing that? Well, you could you could pick a larger you could move the the hearing or, or the session to room ten or eleven or uh, one of the other um, the the room over at one thirty three or at the pavilion. I mean, you know, you can move to a larger room. I mean, you can pretty much when it's a you know if the subject was Vermont Yankee or or marriage or gun reform or late in the appropriations process, you could you you often know. Uh, which issue is going to draw a crowd. And I mean, I think that the Vermont media has been, it, I mean, it's a small state. We, we work together pretty well and you could, this would not be a problem. But it might be even like a request that you reach out to the committee chair ahead of time to let them know you're interested in going so that they know to move it. You know, that's. 
but at least we'd be there when it's over to be able to ask questions. Uh, yeah. Mike Donahue, I saw your hand come up. You're muted right now. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, obviously, we do. Uh, there is pooling in the court system, and and so Senator Parent, if you're concerned about numbers, uh, you know, I don't want to necessarily speak for TV, but obviously, what happens in court is one of the camera crews does the shooting, and the other feed into it. So you you don't need necessarily three camera people in in the room. One can shoot and everybody can share it. And that's what happens in the courts if you had to go to a pooling situation. Am I safe in assuming though, Mikey would prefer to not be in a pooling situation? Uh, I think that would be uh, everybody's preference in the media. I think ideally, at least for the newspapers, I'll let the broadcasters speak for themselves, but ideally having everybody in person, but is better. Okay. Committee, uh, further questions thus far? If not, I'm gonna move along and just in case some of you were not here when I said this earlier, I received a list of witnesses and I'm going down the, the chronological order of that list. Um, and I don't have any other way of um, trying to shepherd us along. I just wanna make sure if any of you are pressed for time, please, if your name isn't being called, let me know so we can try to get you in. Uh, Jay Barton, I have you up next on my list. Welcome to Senate Institutions. Thank you, Senator, and uh, thank all of you for allowing us to speak here for a moment. I really appreciate specifically the proactive consideration of uh, the media in this case and reaching out to us with the invitation. Um, I appreciate that. Anyway, my name is Jay Barton. I'm the Vice President General Manager of uh, WCAX channel three. So as I like to joke, uh, even before the YouTube channel began streaming, that just means everything is my fault at channel three. So if you're watching <laughs> Stuart, now, you know, uh, anyway, the, uh, um, I, I am very grateful for the chance to speak on this topic. Um, as, uh, Stuart just said, in terms of review and commentary on the space assessment from the architect, um, I think the discussion is centered in the correct place overall, which is vital functions of government, operational reality of being just on the ground in the building and trying to conduct business. I think those are, are good things to focus on. Uh, and the pandemic is a crisis, yes, but it's also a little bit of an opportunity um, for these considerations to perhaps move forward. Um, so in general, as we look ahead to, to what the uh, Freeman, French Freeman team defined as longer term, which would be three plus years, three to 10 year window. Um, much of that, again, not an architect, but just much of the concepts uh, make sense. So, so I don't really have anything to, to say to that, especially you know, focusing on keeping the historic nature of the 1858 construction at the State House in place and, and as similar to the museum in place concept as possible. But um, my purpose today is just to underline um, whatever the path forward, I don't believe that there should be an interruption of access to the people's house by the people. Uh, I'm sure every member here and across the entire legislature would agree, open and transparent government is something Vermont has always aspired to and more than that uh, has actually achieved uh, more, probably more often than not. I just don't think that when, as we anticipate a challenge, potentially because of either return to society hesitancy we have vaccine hesitancy. This may be return to society hesitancy that we're looking at. That's the challenge we face for the 2022 session. And it feels like uh, just saying, well, we're not going to let anybody else into the building is choosing expediency over responsibility. Um, and most Vermonters are busy anyway while the legislature is in session. They're doing things like, I don't know, earning wages and paying taxes which is kind of an interesting little deal. And it follows that whatever plans are made, whether a short or long-term plan, because most of the citizenry is gonna be otherwise engaged during the session, access by a vibrant press corps to report the business of the state back to the people of the state is what we need to protect. Um, I mean, first of all, we in the media are Vermonters ourselves and we then serve the needs of Vermonters uh, as citizens. So uh, one of the things that really concerned me 
in general as it as it leads directly to what they're calling option A. And I assume they call it option A because that means it's the first or more pre most preferred option. Um, is this return to the state house for legislators and staff only? And um, I know that this is going to be a difficult issue to resolve. I think several of the questions just now: cr credentialing, limited access. What about a vaccine passport? How do we how do we act as Solomon and make a wise decision? Uh, these are great questions. I understand that that's that, that it is difficult, but. Um, just limiting access can't be the answer outside of an emergency situation, which is where we are right now. I think most of us will agree, or at least if we can agree, that we will most likely not be under an emergency declaration in January of 2022. And if most of us can agree that during the session in 2022, restaurants, bars, hotels, inns, salons, grocery stores, and so on will all operate open to the public with no access restrictions. I question how the seat of government for the state reasonably could consider excluding access by Vermonters and the press uh, to the proceedings. You know, we have created new paths through technology. We've enjoyed the benefits of it. We've also suffered that pain as well. I mean, we're culturally more comfortable. Uh, as much as I love the Brady Bunch reference, uh, I would prefer to see Stuart and everyone else, uh, Paul in person. Um, so, so the teleconference friend, friendly reality is maybe the mother of invention and just the result of necessity. But, uh, you know, we've seen more than one mishap in the last 15 months. I think Mike alluded to it in his testimony. Uh, whether that mishap, those mishaps were unintentional or otherwise, it's limited remote access of citizens. And, you know, one mistake and everyone loses access. So technology alone in in my estimation, is not a replacement for access in person. In person, I do agree, uh, Senator, with your statement early on. It's an addition uh, to access, and that's a good thing, I think. But um, if the legislature is in the building, Vermonters should be as well. And uh, no one is living in a bubble here. During the next session, most of us will also likely simultaneously enjoy a meal out at a restaurant. Um, we might visit the grocery store. We might spend time with friends. And... Um, I expect those interactions will be made not just by those of us in the media, but perhaps by those of us in the legislature. And so if those things are acceptable, but access to the people's house is not, uh, one might argue that that defies simple logic. Um, so if we're not living in a bubble, how can we govern in one? As responsible citizens of the state, in my opinion, we in the media, certainly my station, we've uh, tried to follow every protocol and be a reasonable model uh, for every rule. We participated with the government in helping provide access to people, not just through regular reporting, but you know, we've been on the phone with, uh, I, know, I know many of us uh, in the media here have had different conversations with different, whether legislators or the governor's office to try and solve problems on behalf of the government so that we can reach the people. Of course, we would want to continue that if there are concerns. Uh, moving forward. And so if that's what is necessary to strike a balance, uh, you know, I think Stuart said it earlier and I, I'm, he, he stole my answer, as I like to say, uh, because I'm more than happy uh, to lend my time or the time of some of my staff if we need to try and find some uh, reasonable middle ground, at least in the short run, uh, technologically. Um, I, I guess I'll just close with uh, this statement, uh, Vermont Press is fortunate to operate in an environment that recognizes the importance of open government and transparency. I just implore this committee and uh, whoever else takes this up to ensure that whatever steps forward are made, we don't also move backward with regard to access by Vermont's media and by Vermonters in general, just in the spirit of, of open and transparent government. So you know, there's, my, there's my statement and uh, now, uh, Dick or whoever, come at me. Let's go. Well, first, I want to say that um, in case your colleagues missed it, I think you provided the sound bite for the day. If we oh, that's not, really good. Which one was it? So I can. Uh... Um, I have it down. If we are not living in a bubble, and you were referring to all general businesses, how can we govern in one? And I think that's I appreciate that. I, I love. I love. Have you considered writing for television? Oh, don't tell them that, please. Please, don't do that. 
<laughs> and, and, and by the way, I apologize if I'm being too um, familiar in this in this environment, but I do appreciate, Senator, uh, all of your uh, attitude as we've come into this conversation. So thank you. Jay, I think you'll find this committee especially uh, loves to have an open and free flowing conversation. And sometimes it gets impersonal, as some might uh, suggest. But as a Rotarian, I live by a creed that we all at uh, the adult age live on a first name basis. And sometimes people find that somewhat offensive, but uh, I have always encouraged the ability of all of us to communicate at a, a very common level. So I appreciate your comments and uh, great thoughts. Um, let me ask you a question though. First of all, my committee meets in a room that is 225 square feet in size. Um, if there was a sign on the door that said, uh, capacity eight, and you're the ninth person coming along to get into the room and somebody suggests you're gonna to have to participate remotely. Either you're gonna to have to go find your own computer or you're gonna find a room down the hall that we've arranged this remote access in. I'm, I'm just looking to get your reaction to that kind of a suggestion. Um, you know, off the cuff, one of the thoughts that I had uh, in an earlier back and forth, uh, there was the question about limiting access or potential pooling. Um, one of my thought processes, and this, this is maybe a redirect a little bit of that, that concept is number one, um, you know, it may mean that uh, if the capacity is eight, uh, perhaps we just need to go to a more, I hate to say formal, but a, a more structured perhaps, um, you know, like in this case, we set up a, a series of witnesses and uh, uh, testimonies for, for this interview. Perhaps when we're back in person, uh, we're doing something largely the same. If if you're not on the docket, you can join via the uh, via some sort of remote kiosk or, like you say, some other technological apparatus that we could make up. Uh, but but the thought of having some sort of uh, existing structure and and perhaps that structure, as you suggest, is based on the physical limitations of the meeting space. You know, in in your committee room. Uh, the limit is committee plus eight or plus five or whatever. And in another committee room that's larger, it's committee plus 10. You know, you follow my logic. Yeah. Um, that might be a starting point where, where there's at least an equal opportunity to sign up to be in the room. Um, and I know you don't want to disadvantage a person. That's where the technological uh, hybrid comes into play. But that's... Uh, I, I'm not against the idea, but I do think that if there's a, a, a sort of in-person process that everyone is aware of, I don't think that that's a restriction so much as just a structure. And, and others may disagree with me and, and I would welcome that because I'm uh, doing this live, so. That's okay, we do that as legislators all the time. We constantly legislate on the fly. Yeah. Um, I, I am cognizant of the time. I'm gonna keep us moving along, but let me, yes also say that we know prior to COVID-19, there were air problems inside the building that need to be addressed. One of them is the obvious mold in the building, but another one was the humidity levels and the, the close confines almost create a Petri dish every year for legislators and others to pick up the flu or whatever the case may be um, so the HVAC system, I don't know if it's going to take care of that problem or not, but I just want to alert you all that that remains a problem, and that was prior to COVID, and we're doing our best to try to resolve it. But in the case of our committee room, 225 square feet, there's not a whole lot you can do if you've got 10 additional people beyond the committee and staff trying to jam into the room. That is problematic. So. I'm anxious to hear from others about their reaction to that. What if the sign says eight capacity, you're the ninth person coming along. How do you react to that? Um, but Jay, thanks again for coming. Paul, I've got you down next. Hello, senators. Thank you for having me here today. I appreciate it. Paul? I will say one upside to this style of legislating is I can actually drink my coffee without <laughs> Secretary Bloomer coming in and 
<laughs> can't get out of my hands. Um, so I won't say that it's, uh, it's totally void of upside, not to mention cell phones. Um, for the record, my name is Paul Heinz, and I uh, first covered the legislature um, on a very part-time basis in 2007 when I was a local reporter for the Brattleboro Reformer. I spent about nine years at seven days um, covering the legislature um, as a reporter, as a columnist, and um, for time as political editor. And uh, for the last uh, five months or so, I have been the managing editor of vtdigger.org. Um, it's nice to see you all today. Um, I will not mince words, um, which probably won't surprise many of the members here today. Um, with all due respect to the General Assembly and to its consultants, uh, these recommendations are appalling. They are unacceptable and they are unconstitutional. The framers of the Vermont Constitution made quite clear, and I quote, that the doors of the house in which the General Assembly of this Commonwealth shall sit shall be open for the admission of all persons who behave decently. These recommendations would slam those doors shut on the public and the press. The authors of this report clearly do not understand what it means to provide access to legislative deliberations. In the section describing the quote unquote pros of the proposal to allow only legislators and staff into the state house, they write that public access could be maintained merely by broadcasting and recording meetings. Elsewhere, they suggest that it could be maintained by allowing the public and press to watch live broadcasts from nearby quote, public viewing rooms. This fundamentally misconstrues the role of the press. If we are to perform our duty of holding government to account, we must know what our government is up to. The prospect of legislators writing laws for the citizenry in a locked building, choosing when to hit record and when not to is horrifying and it cannot happen. I recognize the challenges that you all have faced over the past 14 months, trying to preserve access to legislative deliberations. And I would agree that in some ways, the move to Zoom has added additional transparency, accountability, and access uh, to those who have historically been unable to attend daytime meetings in Montpelier. But we've also seen a number of truly troubling incidents during which legislators failed to or chose not to broadcast their work for the people. Just yesterday, a Senate committee learned that its YouTube stream was down and its leaders chose to plow ahead with public testimony in private. This is unacceptable. The way to prevent it is to have reporters in the room when a quorum of a public body is present. This is essential, and in my view, it's not negotiable. I understand how eager you are, you all are to return to the State House, but if you can't find a way to bring the public and the press with you, I think that you should think twice about doing so. We will fight this in the court of public opinion, and if necessary, in court. I would also like to, if I could very briefly answer a couple of the questions that you, or respond to a couple of the questions that you posed to some of the other witnesses and address some of the um, comments that came up earlier in this hearing. Uh, Senator Benning, I think you described um, the early part of uh, these public hearings that is not broadcast to the public um, as lacking what you called substantive conversations, that it's just idle banter between friends and colleagues. The problem is that we don't know that that's the case. You tell us that that's the case, but there is no public record. There is nobody there to monitor it. You're asking us to trust you, and that's not what our job is. We trust, but we also have to verify. It's not enough, in my view, for you to tell us that you're not conducting public business before you hit that go live button. In my view, if regardless of who goes back to the state house when, if you are recording these, uh, these meetings, I hope that you continue to do so. <clears throat> the moment that a quorum of a committee or of the house or of the Senate is present, that is the moment in my view that the button should be pressed to go live. To briefly address your question, Senator Benning, about what to do with the capacity of eight problem. Um, I think the answer to that is pretty simple. If you can't fit the public and the press in a committee room, you should find a larger committee room. It's not for us to figure out 
who to choose, who comes, who goes. It's up to you to find an adequate space to do your work. And I, like Stuart, am not an architect, um, and I'm not familiar with all the space available. I've read the report, um, but I do know a little bit about the city of Montpelier, and I know that just down the road, there's the Capitol Plaza with a number of huge event rooms. I can probably think of, you know, 10, 15 large rooms with a couple minutes walk of the state house. And I think that if the legislature wanted to find rooms that were big enough to accommodate the public and the press in the, in the near term, the medium term, I think that you could do so. Um, I would also just briefly uh, address the question of limiting access to just a couple of reporters or to a pool. Um, I would uh, differ with some of my colleagues on this question. I don't think that's uh, adequate or appropriate either. Um, I think that you would encounter some serious problems if you were to try to decide uh, how many reporters could come into a room, which reporters, who is a reporter. This is something that we talked about uh, with all of you a couple of years ago when um, you had the wisdom and sagacity to pass a media shield law. And one of the things that um, we talked about at the time was how do you determine who is a reporter? Um, and that is a really challenging question to answer. And it's not uh, a question that should be answered, in my view, by government officials. And that was the view of the legislature as well. Uh, when you passed that media shield law, um, you, in your infinite wisdom, chose not to try to uh, limit what a reporter was to someone who reported for a print uh, news outlet or a television station or what have you. You defined it as an individual or organization engaging in journalism or assisting an individual or organization engaging in journalism at the time the news or information sought to be compelled was obtained. The reason for that is that things change. 10 years ago, VT Digger probably would have been considered a blog. Um, you know, when Ann Galloway, my boss, first started covering the legislature, um, I don't think she would have fall, fell under any uh, traditional definition of what a uh, news organization was at the time. Um, and she could have been excluded if this was not an open policy. Uh, and I don't think that it is the role of um, you and your colleagues to exclude people who are conducting journalism. Um, and I don't think that we as reporters should, um, should cave and uh, allow limitations to be placed on how many people, um, how many reporters should be in the building at a given time. So, um, Again, I will stop rambling, but I will just reiterate that uh, we want you to come back. I want you to come back, uh, but it is on you to figure out how to do that while following the Constitution and providing the access that we all require. Appreciate your bluntness. Um, you brought up a joke from yesterday when you cited the constitutional provision, which says the doors of the State House must be open but the terminology is wrapped around to those with good behavior. And I was curious to know how it was that legislators managed to pass that initial hurdle. Well, I've wondered that about Senator Mazza for quite a long time, but they <laughs> continue to let him into the building, so. Um, so there are lots of things to think about. Dick McCormick, you got your hand up first. Yeah, I wanna thank you for your, your comment about that, that the, the open hearing, open to the public, is really non-negotiable, and I, I agree. And I'm, I, this is the first I've heard that there was a committee that conducted business out of the hearing of the public, and that's that's troubling. But I want to mention that both committees that I serve on uh, had trouble, and in both cases, we simply recessed until the trouble was fixed. And in one case, uh, recess got the trouble fixed, and then had to recess yet again. And uh, also that um, the president pro tempore of the Senate admonished us uh, not to do our work out of the hearing of the public. So I, I think that's, I think we have an agreement on that point. I'd be happy to respond to that. If, I don't know if you're calling for a response. Um, I appreciate that. And I, I do wanna be clear. I recognize that um, you, know, you all are doing your best. Um, and I very much appreciate uh, the Senate President Pro Tem's um, insistence yesterday on shutting down uh, committee hearings when the problem was yeah. affected. Um, but the, the problem is, in my view, that 
Um, we just we have heard of a number of times over the course of the last 14 months in which something was said um, before or after the hearing was um, was live. But what really worries me is what we don't know about. Right? We only hear about things when uh, people tell us um, or when it's very obvious because you know the the live stream turns on. Uh, halfway through a conversation. And that conversation sure sounds like it has something to do with public business. Um, I don't think that you all are um, deviously trying to avoid public scrutiny, but I also think that um, you may have different standards about what information ought to be public and what conversations ought to be public. Um, and I think it is, um, to me, it's a very simple solution. Just keep just the part about uh, when meetings should be broadcast. Um, you know, to me, the rule is when there's a quorum, you know, uh, if it takes a while to get all of the senators um, onto the floor, I don't quite understand how that technology works, but I understand it takes a little while. Um, and if that's the case, then when that 16th senator shows up, um, I think it ought to be, uh, it ought to be viewable by the public at that moment. Huh. And same with the committee, you know, third committee member shows up in a five member committee, bam, it's live, it's public. So what would you do right now if YouTube for some reason or other got disconnected. What what would you expect this group to do at that moment in time? To shut it down immediately. And that you, my, my understanding is that is the expectation of the Senate President Pro Tem, and it doesn't matter. You know, you, you are not you, to, I mean, this is clear as day. You are not to continue doing the business of the public behind closed doors. And it's not acceptable just to record a meeting and maybe put it online later on. Um, the moment that, uh, you know, let's think about it. If, if you were in the state house, if there was um, some reason you had to get rid of the public because of a, sa a safety threat, you know, security threat, would you keep meeting then? No, you'd shut it down. Um, and that's the same here. You, if there is a quorum of public body, and this is very clear in Vermont's open meetings law, which your predecessors passed, um, arguably excluded yourselves, um, but uh, passed it for all other public bodies in the state. Um, and you know, I think it's very clear. Um, it's the same thing we ask of select boards. It's the same thing we ask of city councils. Uh, you know, if you've got a quorum of uh, public servants at a party, and they start talking about public business, um, that's not kosher. If you have a quorum of public body um, writing each other over email, starting to make decisions, that's not kosher. That all needs to be done in the view of the public. So let me see if I get this right, because I hear you saying two things. First, that it all should be in the public eye anytime there is a quorum available. And then second, you're, you're dancing around the conversation of whether public business is being conducted. And I just want to make sure I'm getting the right message from you. If YouTube shuts down right now, is it your thought that this screen of people should immediately be disbanded because I'm trying to figure out logistically, how do we get back together to figure out that we're actually ready to proceed mm. if, if we are in that, that gray area between actually conducting business. And I understand and appreciate your comment about you need to trust us but from a logistics standpoint, how do we literally get shut off on YouTube and make a, a move to assemble the group again? How do we get from here to there? See, I think that question is a bit of a trap with all due respect, because I don't think that it's for us as members of the press uh, to be answering these logistical questions. You know, it's not for us to design the layout of the state house. Uh, it's not for us to um, reserve a room at the Capitol Plaza to allow for you to meet. It's not for us to figure out um, how you log on to YouTube or Zoom or whatever, um, but there's a, a very clear principle here um, and one that uh, I will not give on at all, and that is that uh, you know you got to be in the view of the public. So yeah, I do think that if, if the YouTube stream were to shut down right now, I'd say log off. Um, that would be my recommendation, but um, you know I, I, I can't make the rules for you around how to go about doing this. I'm not, um, I don't have the answers to that, but I do know what the principle is. Okay, I just, I don't know the answer to that question either, but that's part of this back and forth, trying to figure out what are the parameters. Just so you know, I keep looking down. I actually am taking fairly copious notes. 
and, and we're trying to gather enough information to have a proper conversation. I don't know if there's an answer to this question uh, because literally you do have to assemble a group of people and then you know it's time to turn on YouTube and it may be that you turn on YouTube first. I don't know if technically that's possible, um, but this being part of the conversation, if YouTube were to shut down right now, what you are suggesting is the screen here ought to disappear. And then somehow or other, we have to pass messages back and forth to each other to come back and gather once YouTube is reconnected. Yes, that's what I'm saying. And I, and I think that's totally doable uh, technologically. And I, I don't think that's a huge problem. But okay. that's for an IT person uh, to figure out, not for me. All right, Senator McCormick. Yeah, um, if, we were, if we were live uh, this late in the session, there would be times when we, the Senate would have convened in, in the chamber and work that we thought, that the leadership thought we were ready to do, we, were not, we would not be quite ready. It happens all the time. Uh, a, a, a negotiation just doesn't go as well as expected. Typically, we would recess, not adjourn, but recess until a time certain. And I think the, the technological version of that would be that we could stay hooked up. Everyone darken their screen, everyone put their mic on mute and stay within earshot. And at some point the chair or uh, the staff would say, oh, you know, okay, everybody, we're back. I mean, that, Paul, would that suffice in your view? I think, I mean, you know, if nobody spoke a word, perhaps, you know, but the problem is, I mean, if in the, in the scenario that you lay out, Senator, if, you know, in, during those periods, um, if, you were in, if you were in the building and you recessed, um, there'd be some side conversations, you know, maybe everyone would kind of come up to the uh, dais, right, and start having some conversations about how to proceed. Um, as you probably remember, I would rush up to the dais as well to try to listen to what it is you were saying. I would get real close and I'd try to listen in. Um, and, uh, and we can't do that now. And that's a real problem. So um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, if you had to do that for some reason, okay, but I'll mute, you know, gag rule, no more talking until everyone comes back. Yeah. So prior to COVID, we had a system in place where VPR was live streaming us. But if we went on recess, I don't know the answer to this as I'm thinking about it, but I'm just trying to compare. When we went on recess, I think they the VPR dark. connection was shut down. That's yeah, right. They went dark. Okay. But, you had, but you had reporters in the room who at that point right. would, would be able to go up to the dais again, like I said, and, um, and eavesdrop. Um, we would also know if, say for example, um, who, I don't know actually how it works technically, but whoever is in charge of turning that live stream back on, say that person forgot to click that button to turn it back on, right? Um, in the days when we were all in the same building, you at least had reporters there, they were present and they would yep. be there to capture a record. And so that was a fail safe and that's a fail safe that doesn't exist now. So now if somebody forgets to hit that button, then it's lost. And we have seen um, examples of that happening. It doesn't happen all the time that we know of, but uh, it, it does happen. Recordings have been lost. Um, it's just, it's a reality of this technology. Yep. All right, so my final quote for you is no quorum plus YouTube equals shutdown. Or did I get that backwards? No YouTube and a quorum equals shutdown. There we yeah. go. I would agree with that formula. Okay. I can't make any promises. I'm just trying to gather information here and figure out how to proceed with it all. So thanks for the comments. Any other questions for Paul? Devin, I don't think you and I, I'm sorry, Senator Mazza, go ahead. If you set a time to start a meeting, like say two o'clock, maybe I misunderstood this, and there's a five member committee and three members are there, you don't have to start the meeting. You still have to wait till two o'clock. Is that correct? Well, in the scenario that I'm envision that I'm envisioning, um, if it's two o'clock meeting, uh, but because you are a very punctual, Senator, I know that you'd probably be there at one fifty-five, and if two of your colleagues were there by one fifty-seven, I would argue that at one at uh, one fifty-seven, you'd click that button, 
you'd go li you'd go live at that point. The meeting may not formally start until two o'clock as warned, uh, but we would at least at home be able to see uh, what was going on when a quorum of members wasn't present for that meeting. Just as we were, I, mean, I always thought time time was the was the precedent to start a meeting. So it isn't. It's when the quorum shows up. I'm seeing. Well, I guess to to um, I, I, what I'm seeing, starting the meeting and starting the the feed as being two distinct things. So yeah, um, yeah I would think that the meeting itself should be started at the time that it was warned. Uh, so two o'clock. But the there's no reason why the YouTube stream. I mean, right now the YouTube stream starts whenever the chair says it should, right? So you all were here present um, at whatever time we started, 1.30. Right. Uh, and um, we started jabbering away. And then uh, when the chair chose to um, uh, get going, he, he uh, instructed the committee system to go live. So um, I think, you know, in my view, again, um, the moment there's a quorum, you start the YouTube um, or the Zoom, the YouTube, I guess, um, and then maybe you don't start the business until two o'clock until that previously warned. Because everybody, the committees that, uh, that I've been serving on, they wait till the time that then they go live at 2.15 or 2.30 or three o'clock. They don't turn it on prior to that. So there is discussion going on, just how was your weekend, what's happening? And so that, I, I don't know that, I don't maybe someone else experienced the same thing. Anybody other members of the committee are hearing that? Well, I, I think it's pretty clear what Paul's saying, and we have never really had a major conversation about this, but once you have reached quorum status, his position is the YouTube should be on and flowing. And if you are retaining a quorum status after the substantive topic is um, evaporated, you are still expected in Paul's eyes to maintain the YouTube um, link as long as that quorum is still well, that, on the screen. That was my question. Understand. Is that is that what we have to do? I mean, if you if your meeting is done and you're you go off and live, it's not. No. Corey, it disappeared there. You started and then you went max head drum on me. Uh, Wait for Corey to come back. But I I, I see this the same. Um, conversation should be had about the opposite end of the meeting. When the members are um, done with the topic for discussion, right, we usually right. turn off YouTube. That's right. What your position, Paul, is, is as long as there is a quorum there, even if they're only talking about what time are we meeting tomorrow, um, you would prefer to have us on live YouTube. Absolutely, whether it's before or after the yeah, scheduled but, meeting. But you can't, you can't talk about anything. I mean, you can't talk about the family or the friends or the weekend or nothing else. You have to go public with it? You sure? I, you're welcome to talk about all of those things in my view, but the public should be there to make sure that that's what you're talking about. You know, I think you just brought a very good example, Senator Benning, you know, when the meeting, uh, the substantive part of the meeting ends, um, you turn off the feed and then you're talking about when you're gonna meet the next day. I would think that's something that would be highly relevant to members of the public and the press. I think that's something that we should know. You know, there's a lot of, there, I mean, this is not uh, new, I think, to the Zoom era. There have always been, there's always been the pre-meeting and the post-meeting, right, of any- uh, No, we can, they can say that, sure. You can say when your meeting is gonna be your schedule for the next day, but I, I just don't think there's an opportunity for anybody to have any other question, any other com uh, discussion about your private life. I mean, you can't, once you've gone off officially, can't you talk about something else without going? With all due respect, and you froze there, Senator, so I apologize. No. I, I, so yeah, I, think I, caught, okay. I think I caught most of what you were saying. And yeah. uh, with all due respect, um, I don't think that's the forum for those private conversations. I think that if you have an expectation of privacy, uh, it should not be um, you know, when you're meeting as a public body um, for the state of Vermont. Well, let, let's be clear about the line of demarcation. Your triggering device is the quorum. Once that's attained, you're saying that that is absolutely when the public needs to be listening on YouTube. That's my view. Um, and if there is not a quorum, I'm, I'm sure you would say you prefer to have it live streaming anyway, but there is not that same um, clear line of demarcation 
that a quorum would bring about? In my view, that's the uh, line of demarcation that I think is reasonable. Um, you know, it's the same. It's the same, and I've had this argument with many of you before. Um, when a quorum of the House, for example, I know the Senate would never do this, except that one time when I caught you in the basement of the Department of Labor building. Um, but when a quorum well, that wasn't that wasn't my caucus, so you can't accuse <laughs> that, me. Of that. Was, that is very true, Senator. That was not your caucus, so so you are not one of the offenders there. Um, but uh, let's just take the House because um, it's easier to. Uh, besmirch um, the other body uh, when you know there is a. I'm just going to warn the rest of my committee. This is a great time for the Fifth Amendment. <laughs> just remain silent. I'm not trying to draw you into a trap, but when uh, when this when the House Democratic Caucus has one of its famous offsite meetings, um, you know, somewhere else in Montpelier, and they're you know basically talking about they're not bas they're talking about public policy at those meetings. And they are, uh, perhaps they're doing it through a political lens, but they're talking, they're basically making a, a, a plan for how they're going to uh, do the business of the public. They're doing it in secret, behind closed doors, without notification to the public or the press. I've always believed that's completely inappropriate. And I've written that many times. I've harangued you all about this. Um, we probably shouldn't, I probably shouldn't bring this up. <laughs> I'll regret doing so. But uh, the, uh, the Committee on Committees that Senator Mazza uh, is a longtime member of, um, I've always felt that uh, when uh, the, when that committee is meeting, um, it ought to be open to the, the public and the press um, because it is a committee of the state legislature. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think I've been making the same argument for a le very long time uh, and I will continue to make it. You know, when there is a quorum of public body meeting, uh, we ought to be present for it. Okay, you, you have received pushback from our legislative council, I understand, I from time to time. I have. Oh, and support from the Secretary of State. Yeah. No, I, I think your, your points of conversation are necessary as we move forward. So I appreciate your, your bluntness um, and you're willing to stand up for what you believe in. That's perfectly part of this conversation. And I appreciate you coming for that. Corey, you got cut off. You were about to ask a question. And I don't know whether or not um, your question was answered. Corey, are you listening? Well, I'm still here. Dick McCormick, can you hear me? Because you've got a hand up. I can hear you. Can you okay. hear me? I can hear you. I don't know where Corey went again, but what's your question? Okay, well, I, I, first of all, I, I want to just say that, that uh, Paul, I, I actually agree with you. And uh, even if I didn't, <laughs> my sense is uh, sometimes... Does everyone know the story of Jesse Owens at the 1937 or whatever it was Olympics, where he was a broad jumper and and his he was doing so well it embarrassed the Nazis' master race theory, and they kept ruling him that he had started he had overstepped the line, and what he finally did on his third and final try is he just jumped from about eight inches back behind the line just gave them the, he didn't argue, he gave them the, the extra, and he, and he got a gold medal. I think even if people disagree with, with uh, Paul's argument, we could, we could do this and it would just make for a higher level of public confidence in what we're, and how we do our business. Because I think technology, it's really not all that difficult. It's a version of what we do when the Senate is live. Um, you know, and just uh, it's up to the to the person chairing to make a good estimate. I remember it certainly well uh, with a, per, a previous pro tem that we would spend a whole afternoon recessing ten minutes at a time. <laughs> we could have recessed for two hours and gone and Dick, done something. But Dick, let me just uh, cut you off for a second. Denise, can you check the waiting room and see if Corey is trying to get back in? Sorry about that. I didn't want to interrupt you. Yeah. No, I, I think air, that we, we want to err on the side of uh, public trust. That's a term of art. You know what I mean? The public hmm. trusting us. Boy, you're talking different today than usual. You know? Oh, me? <laughs> Well, the press is Corey, right. you're back. I don't know. I, press, you, you tried to ask a question a couple times and you ended up off in Max Headroom Lane. What, what's up? Yeah. Oh, no, I, I was just going to say, you know, 
the importance of this, you know, the public's really important too, but, you know, when we talk about governing in a bubble, you know, I'm getting a lot of my information from the work that these folks on screen are doing because we don't have the conversation, you know, in the hallways with our colleagues. And so, you know, the information that comes out is just important us to do our work. It is, you know, for the public to know what we're doing or what's going on in the other body. It's communication is a lot more difficult now than it ever has been in this job. And, um, you know, we, you know, I'm relying on all sources that I, you know, typically I wouldn't be on Twitter looking for information in a committee or something, but you're looking for that now because, you know, you're, you're just trying to see what's going on across the building, which, you know, we're not in. Yeah. Any other comments, questions for Paul? Mike, you had your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, following up, we had sort of talked about the beginning of uh, when to record, but you know, the ending is, uh, there was an episode last night that I saw firsthand at a select board meeting where there was a last minute executive session. They came out, they voted in action, some people in the audience didn't know about it. They started asking questions. The select board adjourns. They tried answered a few questions, but didn't answer others. Quickly adjourns. <clears throat> and the YouTube, several people came up to the table to ask the select board questions. And the YouTube just shut right off. And so there was obviously some sort of well, I won't say confrontation, dialogue between those in the audience not feeling that they had been given all the answers and everything like that. And obviously a quorum was still right in front of uh, the audience and everything like that. There was answers being given and the people at home have no idea what was told at that point. So it is important at both ends as to when the recording is. And, and the other thing is it's not an exact parallel, but if you ever look at C-SPAN, and the, uh, the uh, audio is off, but you can still see the video and you can see who's talking to who and you can call up Peter Welch and say, hey, I saw you talking to Nancy Pelosi. What were you talking about or something like that? So it is important to record and make available as much as possible. Thank you. Mike, just uh, you're bringing up an is issue here I hadn't thought about before, but if we go back into the state house. And for the most part, we're all back. We're doing things like we used to do. But we've added this new component of Zoom streaming. And Paul, this comes back to you. If the Zoom button suddenly disappears from my screen and I realize we're not transmitting anymore, does the committee business shut down at that point? Is this a question for me? <laughs> For you, you yeah, too. I mean, I'll, I'll, take a, I'll take a stab at it. I mean, I think that's, um, you know, if you've got reporters, if you have full access to the room with reporters, um, I think it is a little uh, less reasonable to expect you to shut down at that moment. Um, that's a backstop, in my view. Um, I do think that uh, there are probably ways to, um, to prepare for that possibility. For example, having audio. Uh, recording going on at the same time, um, I, you know, just as a fail safe. Um, and I, I would recommend that as well um, to at least have a, uh, you know, a copy of that for posterity. Um, but I think the key is to have um, reporters there and members of the public there uh, when the business is being conducted. Um, the argument that I was making uh, really, I think, is mostly focused on the all Zoom scenario. Okay. I got you. I just want to make sure we're, we're both on the same page. And I, I would, I, I, I'd certainly concur. I, I, I think you could always take a, a two minute break and just say, hang on a minute, let's see if the button can be reset or something like that. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's too much of a problem because sometimes okay. an IT guy can get you back up and running yeah. with a little delay. Jay, I see your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I could just point out all of this uh, haranguing over uh, YouTube would be eliminated if we just had access to the state house. So well, how much easier it, our lives would be. Yeah, no, it, it, I understand that, but I have been quoted a couple of times recently as saying Zoom is going to be a permanent part of our life. Does no, Zoom I, then become a 
a triggering mechanism for when the committee can and cannot meet, or is it just there to monitor as best it can the proceedings, assuming we have reporters in the building and everybody's acting as we usually do. Um, but I understand, Paul, very clearly that this is a Zoom-only environment question we're talking about. If the Zoom shuts down and we have a quorum, we should shut down. Um, anybody else for questions at this yes. moment in time? Devin, I don't see anybody else's hands coming up. I'm not sure we've ever met before. So if we uh, could figure out who you are and how you fit into this conversation, we'd appreciate it. You are correct on that, Senator Betting. So my name is Devin Bates. I've been a reporter for Local 22, Local 44 News in Colchester for three years. Um, but I just became our primary state house correspondent this legislative session. And so obviously I uh, haven't stepped foot in the state house, but I've been covering it uh, for the whole session. You mean um, you've, been, I did... you've been downgraded by your channel, you mean? <laughs> well, some might say that. <laughs> Um, but uh, prior to that, I did have the opportunity to cover certain meetings, public hearings, state of the state addresses and things like that. So I had a little bit of a sense on how things work on the day to day. And uh, I just want to start off saying I support what fellow members of the media have said. And it's not lost on me that they all have exponentially more experience than me in Montpelier when it comes to this stuff. Um, but I thought it was important for Local 22, Local 44 uh, to be here as well. And um, particularly what Stuart and Jay had to say from a TV perspective, I thought that was really insightful. Um, diving into daily coverage of the legislature remotely has been a bit of a mixed bag. You know, on the one hand, I'm always kind of a one man band. I'm carrying the camera, all the equipment. So I'm saving time by not having to travel and lug four bags of equipment up two flights of stairs. I enjoy that part of it. So I'm able to sort of maximize the workday and bring viewers more coverage because I'm not spending all of that time just kind of getting to where I'm going. And I'm not having to prioritize, you know, which issue are we going to cover today? If there's two committee meetings happening in the same time, then I don't have to decide which one to go to. And so that has been really good. Um, on the other hand, the public, I miss how relevant they were in testimony beforehand. Um, you know, I can think of a few times I showed up for a hearing. There were people lined up outside both side doors of the state house. Um, I miss the ease of access for the public because then that allows us to share their concerns a little easier. And I know that there have been, uh, for instance, you know, parents testifying about childcare, things like that on Zoom. I think that's been great because then these parents who have a busy schedule are able to speak to you guys directly in a way that I don't know would have been possible before. So I don't want to bash on these remote meetings too much because I think there's been a lot of good that has come out of them. Um, even sometimes you're able to hear from them a little more because I, when I'm up on the second deck in the house there shooting the camera down, I've had to do stories where it's the back of this person's head when they're testifying. I mean, it's hard to really convey what they're feeling or get the sense of their testimony when you're not really seeing them. And so in some ways, I think being able to see each person's individual face on Zoom has been good. I'm concerned that if the legislature goes back in person, that we might get stuck sort of in the middle of this easy to access remote meeting and then the full in-person coverage that I was talking about. Um, meaning, so say you're in a small committee room, only a certain amount of people are allowed in. If you're still streaming it live, I'm curious if it's going to be like we see now where everybody can be clearly seen or if that live stream is then going to be a wide angle shot of each committee <laughs> member. That's not necessarily conducive to TV. You're not seeing people up close, their facial expressions and things like that. Um, and I think it was Stuart who mentioned just the nature of those rooms isn't quite ideal for cameras sometimes, but I think that there's a lot to be said about making sure that, you know, if, if there is still a streaming option that you're able to sort of see people clearly and it's not this wide angle shot of everybody, you know, that's just one of the concerns that we have to take into account in TV when we're putting together a story. Um, I'm just looking to make sure that I sort of got all my comments out here. Um, 
So I think there's a way to bring back this sort of important public participation that we saw before the pandemic um, by utilizing the larger spaces, as you mentioned, or as the report mentions in option B. Um, but I just have concerns about the smaller meetings becoming more inaccessible in person and less engaging for viewers to get the story across. So that's all I had. Thank you for your time. Devin, appreciate your coming. Questions for Devin? Um, Devin, I will say in listening to part of your conversation that unless and until your industry invents a universal television camera equivalent to the universal microphone that you put in the middle of the table and everybody gets picked up, I'm not sure how to resolve the back of the head problem. <laughs> Because um, I know I've been in committee rooms where they've never gotten anything but the back of my head, and that, that's always. But you you try very hard to make sure they get the front. I've I've been trying for ten years, and so yeah, you, you're, early you're, I'm, I'm you're succeeding. You're succeeding pretty much every time. You're you're pretty close to the camera. <clears throat> yeah. as, as you can see, we we know each other a lot, and we love to banter <laughs> with each other. I just want to ask Paul a question. Is Paul still with us? I am. Are you, are you ever going to come back to the state house your new position now or what? Because we didn't see the last year or so there when you were, we were before we went, uh, you, are you going to cover the state house anymore? Or you're, you've got a new position now. Do you want me to come back? Well, I know we miss you, you know, cause you always were right there. You know, I just, uh, I, I miss you center as well. Um, <laughs> I did, I, I was, I did. Well, I tried to come back for a little bit, uh, last year before the plague started. Um, but there was also, uh, a presidential primary going on at the same time. Believe it or not, that was only a year ago. Um, I called to congratulate you on your new position, but I never heard anything. I said, my God, he doesn't even take his calls anymore now. I so. don't think I got that message. Maybe no, you called my old number. <laughs> well, I will make it up to you, and I will stop okay. at the store sometime very soon. <laughs> All right, thank I you. I will visit you in per person. All right. And if there's a like forum of a committee there when I get there, I'm going <laughs> to turn on YouTube. And, He's just uh, like the governor, Dick. He's risen to such a level that only certain right. people are allowed access now. That, there so. you go. That's what I thought. I called and I want to congratulate him on his new job, and uh, that's it. I never heard any more. That was, uh, but I didn't know you had to go through somebody now to talk to him. So I think yeah. some of my reporters would like to have less access to me. So uh, <laughs> you should talk to them. They might be more than happy to trade. <laughs> but if you um, reopen, yeah, you'll see me. You all, I'll still come visit you. Okay, I'll, thank you. I promise. <laughs> So let me uh, ask anybody else want to make a comment, have a question. Not seeing anything, I want to make a couple things really clear. The Freeman French Freeman report was presented to us as a way to consider space options. Uh, we learned yesterday that the operational components that go on in that space were really not covered in the report, and I think the architects concede that. Your presentation here today dovetails with that, the, uh, the press access and public access. It was discussed to some extent, but not in the operational forms that you folks all need to have. And I think the architects would also concede that. Um, I do not believe that option A or option B is going to be um, concrete for us. If, if anything, we are looking at hybrid models and part of this conversation today is frankly an honest attempt to try to get as much information as we can before we start making concrete decisions. So a couple of things. This is, again, the tip of the tip of the iceberg. You will likely be invited back for other conversations with other committees, um, but you are stakeholders. We recognize that and we want you to know we are thinking about you in the process. And so we really do appreciate you coming here today to express your opinions. Having said that, um, it is five past three. I think we've exhausted the topic for the moment. Feel free to uh, correspond if there are things that pop into your heads later on, uh, because we will be continuing to gather notes. And just for your knowledge, we have lobbyists coming tomorrow. It should be a whole nother conversation. Mr. Chair, can we talk about everything after they we go off live? Can we talk? Yeah, I want to. I want to get rid of them so we can talk about them while they're not here. <laughs> Make the real decisions then. 
then we can make a real decision. <laughs> so for YouTube purposes, the conversation, um, the topic of conversation has ended. I'm going to follow Paul's lead for the moment and say, Denise, we'll just leave the uh, YouTube on for a moment and they can hear what we actually talk about when the screen goes dark. Um, but I don't usually say much. I just log out. <laughs> I know that that's uh, I'm surprised you're still here, actually. But um, <laughs> Me too. All right, Chairman, you can wait and hear the, what the media all says yeah. to one another yeah. about you. Yeah, you know? I'm going to hit record right now on my phone. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, who did the best job? What do you think is the best guy? What do you think? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Again, the Fifth Amendment comes into play here. <laughs> on the record, to, even when it goes off. <laughs> I, I should tell a kind of a funny story about this building and this process. I'm a lawyer, and I have to go through continuing legal education. And every year, legislative council has a continuing legal education course for all of legislative council. And if you really want to hear funny stories about legislators, you should try to get into one of those continuing legal education classes. Because that was that I had was laughing and just in stitches over. Uh, we, we got a lot of stories about lawyers. So that's good. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyhow, um, committee, you guys are free to go. Everybody else is free to hang around. In committee, you can hang around if you want to, but Denise, I got to know about tomorrow. Yeah, okay. I have a list of witnesses. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Thank you guys again for committee. coming. See ya. Um, Thank you Denise, all very much. Our yes. witnesses, do we have witnesses on schedule for tomorrow is the question. Uh, actually, we don't have a lot, but we have about four right now. I presume we'll have more. Okay. Um, if you get a <laughs> list together by like around 11 o'clock tomorrow, if you could shoot it to me, we're oh, certainly, on certainly. the floor, but I need to figure out what time exactly to meet. I'm assuming we're going to be meeting at one o'clock. Okay. That's uh, what I have down. We'll hold on to that for as long as we can. Okay. Okay. Great. Looks like the quorum's gone, so I can safely excuse myself. <laughs> um, Senator, thank you very much. I really do appreciate it. I'm happy to come back and, and uh, lecture you guys some more. If you Paul's going to be out at six o'clock tonight waiting for something to happen here. <laughs> well, he's, he's still on YouTube now, so he has to make decisions that are very careful. <clears throat> All right. Well, you, I'm guys. signing off. Denise, if you can take us off of YouTube, we'll say goodbye to everybody. Thanks All again right. for coming. Uh, Senator, yeah. thank you. Thank you.